Today's grand rounds um, be given by uh, none other than our uh, dearly beloved and renowned um, vascular surgery chief and M&M &M moral conscious of the department, uh, Dr. Bill Pavard. So, thank you. So this is uh, going to be a relatively basic presentation. Uh, this is a modification of a presentation I gave to a group of endocrinologists at the American Diabetes Association, so it's pretty low level, um, and I think appropriate, uh, appropriate for July. I've got no disclosures. So those of the trainees that work with me know I hate the term the diabetic foot. It's a term we hear all the time, and it implies a significant misunderstanding of the disease process. Patients who have diabetes, uh, one of the biggest problems, actually most, one of the most common causes for hospitalizations and major morbidity in patients with diabetes are problems with the feet. And the ulcers are not all the same. They're due to three different causes. They're due to sensory loss with then the loss of the protective reflexes. Put on a shoe that rubs your foot the wrong way, most of us would throw that shoe away in a matter of minutes. The patient with diabetes won't notice it to the point where they wear a hole in the foot. They get mechanical abnormalities due to the sympathetic loss of the motor intervention to the in intrinsic muscles in the foot and get collapse of the bony architecture, which leads to abnormal weight bearing. And they also can get ischemia. So the patients get ulcers from any single one of these causes or any combination of them. And in order to get successful treatment, you have to diagnose and treat the underlying cause. So I would recommend you throw out the term the diabetic foot because it applies a lack of sophistication in how to manage these patients. And the second thing is your frequency patients with diabetes and ulcer in the foot and the treatment is antibiotics. Well, antibiotics may well be part of the treatment if they're infection, but the infection is never the cause of the problem. It's always secondary. So it's important to, under to find out the underlying root cause. And this is actually a very simple and preventable problem. Patients who take care of themselves with diabetes will never have a foot problem, typically. Uh, the way that it's avoided is by uh, you need to ask your patients to inspect their feet daily in the first sign of any irritation. They need to seek some help. Appropriate shoes and socks are very important. The patient should be in a soft, supportive uh, shoe with good pair of socks. And a simple thing that I learned years ago at a, a course at the Joslin Clinic, the largest diabetic, diabetes clinic in the country, I believe, is that tell your patients if they're going to be out all day, bring in a, an extra pair of shoes and socks, and every four hours or so change the shoes and socks because every shoe will wear uh, different pressure points on the foot, and the socks get sweaty, you get, you get the seams in various spots, and those simple things can be very helpful. Patients seldom want to do the low-tech stuff, though they want the doctor to take care of them. Nail care is important not to cut the tail nails too short, and the foot needs to be moisturized. So that's basically can be the crux of the talk because if patients take care of their feet, they won't get in these problems. And because it's being in the year, going to deal with some definitions. So the definition of an outpatient, anybody know? It's a patient who's fainted. All right. So I'm going to shift now to one of the three causes of, of foot problems in diabetes, and that's going to be based on the rest of my presentation. Is I'm a vascular surgeon, and it's the atherosclerosis in patients with diabetes mellitus. And uh, patients with diabetes get a unique anatomic distribution of their atherosclerosis. It's virtually always infrainguinal. So iliofemoral disease, extreme, or iliac disease is extremely uncommon in patients who have diabetes without a history of smoking, and typically below the pop in the popliteal and distal the popliteal artery. And then they also get involvement of the arteries of nutrition. So typically atherosclerosis affects the arteries of conduction, the arteries without significant branches like the superficial femoral and the popliteal arteries and the, and the common external iliac arteries and the arteries that actually go to the muscles like the internal iliac and the deep femoral artery are relatively spared. That's not the case in the patient with diabetes. They get significant atherosclerotic involvement of the arteries of nutrition as well as of the arteries of conduction. And this is just an example. On the left panel is a patient with normal arteries. On the right side is a patient with diabetes. And you can see the red arrow pointing to the occluded superficial femoral artery, which is pretty typical of most patterns of atherosclerotic disease, including the patient with diabetes. But the yellow arrow is pointing to the deep femoral artery, which has diffuse plaque throughout its length and actually goes on to total occlusion, an extremely uncommon pattern almost never seen in patients who do not have diabetes. 
And then similarly, the patients with diabetes tend to have a significant burden of infrapopular occlusive disease. Again, on your left, a normal arteriogram, which again, was hard for me to find. And on the right side is a patient with diabetes, and you can see that the anterior tibial artery is patent for a bit, but it, it includes perineal arteries included, proximally reconstitutes, posterior tibial arteries totally occluded. So a very typical pattern with diabetes, and it turns out that the infrapopteal arteries tend to be more difficult to treat and are associated with significant problems with tissue loss. So how do you make the diagnosis of atherosclerosis in the patient with diabetes? It involves all the typical uh, uh, patterns of history and physical examination, and then can be diagnosed with some non-invasive tests, and we'll go through all of these. So history of the patient with diabetes seldom develops claudication. So those of you who know something about chronic atherosclerotic disease, a typical pattern we think of is patient goes from no symptoms to claudication, pain with exercise, to pain at rest, to uh, non-healing tissue on the extremity. And that's kind of the common uh, progression in a patient without diabetes. That's very frequently not seen in patients with diabetes. Claudication is not common typically because the arterial disease is distal to the popteal artery and to get claudication you have to have disease in the popteal artery or, or more proximal because that's where the muscles to the, the arteries to the large muscle groups arise. And also pain at rest is uncommon in the patient with diabetes because of the sensory neuropathy in the feet. They frequently don't have that pain and so very typically the first sign that the patient will ha has arterial disease is when they start with an ulcer on the foot which is frequently why it's missed. The patient's got no symptom, they got a sore on the foot, doctor gives them antibiotics and things don't go well from there. So in physical examination, inspection is extremely important. What you will see in a patient with poor circulation typically is dry skin and thickened nails. There'll be loss of hair. And if they get ulcers, they're typically over uh, pressure points over the, uh, in the most distal part of the foot, so over the toes, over the metatarsal heads very commonly, and on the heel. Very typical locations to put an ulcer in the patient with significant lower extremity arterial disease. Physical examination involves obviously checking all the pulses, femoral popliteal and the pulses in the foot. And again, I'd like to remind the audience that a Doppler signal does not equal a pulse. Pulse means there's enough energy in that artery being transmitted through the arterial system that you can actually feel it. Doppler signal just means there's some flow. Doppler signal does not mean anything about the adequacy of flow. Whereas a pulse does imply adequate flow, Doppler signal just means there is some flow, doesn't mean there's good flow. So the, the classic way to uh, determine objectively the, whether there's arterial disease or not is an ankle, uh, ankle arm index, which uh, just for review is the ratio of the pressure at the ankle versus the pressure at the arm. So you inflate a cuff until there's an arterial flow, you let the cuff deflate, and when you detect flow, that's the systolic blood pressure. Problem with patients with diabetes is their arteries tend to be very calcified, and so the ankle arm index very commonly is not accurate. So we tend to measure uh, pressure at the toe because the toe arteries are less severely calcified typically in the patient with diabetes. And the details of this slide are important. The bottom line is the normal ankle arm index is about one. And as arterial disease gets worse, that ratio drops. And once you get down to about 0.3, that's pretty severe arterial insufficiency. However, again, in the patient with diabetes, those pressures typically aren't accurate due to the arterial calcification. So we measure toe pressures, a toe arm index of greater than 0.7 is normal, and less than 0.7 is abnormal. Then we also measure the actual pressures, and a pressure of 60 to 80 millimeters of mercury frequently suggests adequate circulation for healing. Once the pressure in the toe is below 40 or 50 millimeters of mercury, the patient typically may not be able to uh, uh, heal without arterial reconstruction. Duplex scan is uh, typically ordered, usually is not needed for the diagnosis. Uh, duplex scan is a combination of B-mode imaging and then a spectral analysis of the Doppler waveform, which I can show you what that means. So B-mode imaging is just grayscale imaging, the same thing you do to look for gallbladders in the gallstone or a fetus in utero. The uh, ultrasound uh, projects a sound wave and then listens. And when those waves get bounced back, the farther away, the longer it takes to come back, the farther away the reflector is, and it puts a dot at that level. The greater the density difference, the brighter the reflection, the, the bigger the reflection, the brighter the dot, and it basically makes a picture of the artery. Spectral analysis is where you actually take what's called a pulse Doppler. So the Doppler turns on for an instant and just listens for an interest instant, and it listens at a predetermined depth, 
and then it solves an equation to, uh, to look at the frequency shift of what's being reflected at that level. And through that equation, you can actually calculate the velocity of the blood flow. And you can then put on the uh, graph at the bottom of this image here, the velocity versus time and look at a, a waveform in that artery and also look at the velocity in the artery. So as I stated, we seldom need arterial duplex to make the diagnosis. However, it is very helpful in the management of these patients. We use it for treatment planning. So it helps us choose what artery to access for an arteriogram. And if we're gonna do an arteriogram, many of these patients also have renal failure, uh, renal insufficiency, it allows us to limit the amount of contrast if we can determine which arteries have normal flow based with ultrasound, we can limit the contrast just to the abnormal arteries. Typically in the patient with diabetes, we can limit their, the uh, contrast just to the arteries at the knee and below and for a single limb, we can frequently use very low amounts of contrast, 20 or 30 milliliters of contrast and get diagnostic information and frequently treat the arteries with a very small amount of contrast. And then we use duplex ultrasound also to follow patients after we've reconstructed their arteries. Criteria for a diagnosis with the duplex ultrasound, there's lots of different criteria to use. The basic the, for the uh, simple uh, understanding is what we basically look for to detect a significant narrowing is a doubling in the peak systolic velocity. So if there's a focal narrowing in the artery, you get the same volume of blood across a smaller cross-sectional area, the blood needs to speed up. And so we measure the velocity just proximal to the stenosis and through the stenosis or just distal of the stenosis. And if that velocity doubles or more than doubles, that suggests there's a significant narrowing at that level. That's the single simplest, most important criteria. criterion. So this is just an example of a duplex scan of a relatively normal common femoral artery. The B mode image shows a relatively widely open artery. There is a triphasic waveform in the common femoral artery. Just distal to that is a deep femoral artery. You can see the velocity, peak systolic velocity in the common femoral artery was 200 centimeters per second. In the deep femoral artery, it's 414 centimeters per second or a doubling in the peak systolic velocity, suggesting there is a stenosis in that proximal deep femoral artery. And just as a further example, in that same patient, there's no flow detected in the superficial femoral artery. So not an uncommon pattern for a patient with diabetes. So another de definition, cauterize. Made eye contact with her. <laughs> All right, so what do, how do we do, we, how, what do we do to fix these patients? The traditional therapy for lower extremity arterial occlusive disease in the patient with diabetes is a surgical bypass. Traditionally, it's done with the patient's own vein, or if the vein is not available, you can use a synthetic graft. And then we also can do endovascular reconstructions, primarily with balloon angioplasty, stenting, and atherectomy. So just uh, for those who don't know, the bypass is typically done with the patient's great saphenous vein, just as an anatomy view, the great saphenous vein runs from the medial malleolus up the medial aspect of the thigh, calf and the thigh and drains into the femoral vein at the groin. That vein is parallel to the deep vein, so it's a vein that can typically be harvested with minimal morbidity to the extremity. And then we use that vein and sew the vein into an artery above the blockage. So the blue here is a blocked superficial femoral popteal artery with blockage of the perineal and, anterior, and posterior tibial arteries in this image. And the bypass graft is going from the common femoral artery down to the perineal artery distal to the occlusion, a rather typical pattern one might see in a patient with diabetes. And this is a further example. You'll recognize this arteriogram. This is a patient I showed you earlier. The patient has occlusion of the superficial femoral artery and the deep femoral artery. Turns out this is a man actually who had had a coronary artery bypass and they had harvested his right great saphenous vein. He ended up with a 12 by centimeter, 12 by seven centimeter black eschar in his calf where that great saphenous vein had been harvested. There is no uh, filling of the uh, distal superficial femoral popteal artery or the popteal trifurcation. In this man with diabetes, not an unusual pattern, but he did reconstitute flow in his anterior tibial artery with his perineal and posterior tibial arteries occluded. So he had his cephalic veins from both arms harvested and sewn together, and then that vein was anastomosed to the superficial femoral artery tunneled subcutaneously under the skin. You can see here the calcium shadow of his occluded superficial femoral artery. 
and that graft is then tunneled through the interosseous membrane to the side of the anterior tibial artery, and he actually ended up healing that wound uh, and kept his, his limb for the remaining years of his life. We know uh, that veins work a lot better than synthetic grafts, particularly to the arteries below the knee, which is a typical pattern in patients with diabetes. This is a slide I've been showing for my whole career. It's a 31-year-old slide that still, I think, are the best data we have on this issue. This is from a three different centers uh, pooled their results of patients undergoing lower extremity bypass. These are for patients with uh, bypasses to the arteries below the knee. And what they did is they compared the outcome. This is actually a randomized trial where they compared patients with great saphenous vein versus PTFE. And at four years, the patency with saphenous vein was 50% versus 12% for PTFE. So it basically uh, was the confirmation that if you're going to do a bypass to the infrapopteal arteries, you really want to use a patient's own vein because synthetic grafts really underperform in this location. This is a slide looking at compilation from a bunch of different trials and just a general uh, uh, overview of what we can expect for patency. For us, so if you can use a patient's own great saphenous vein, primary patency means the graft's open, you never have to do anything else. About two thirds of those grafts would be open at five years. If you re intervene secondary patency, you can get 70 to 80% of those grafts to stay open for five years, and you can salvage the majority of limbs. PTFE, the most common use synthetic graft, not so good. Two-year primary patency, under 50%, and two-year limb salvage, only about two-thirds, uh, two so not nearly as good as the patient's own vein. There now is available a PTFE graft that have heparin bonded to the surface. There's some early data that suggests that these are better than the basic non-heparin uh, PTFE with maybe 60% through your primary patency. I'm still somewhat skeptical. The data are still relatively uh, small with, with this graft. And when PTFE first came out, the original PTFE back in the 1970s, the early reports were really quite good. Later experience has shown it not to be so good. And there, we still don't really have good uh, comparative data of the heparin bond to PTFE to vein. So it may not be as promising as shown in this slide, but probably better than the, the standard PTFE. Problem is if you do a great saphenous vein bypass, that's a pretty morbid operation. This is a, a slide shared uh, from Dr. David Dawson showing what a typical patient undergoing a bypass. It's a big cut on the extremity of a patient who's typically not very healthy, particularly a patient with diabetes who have problems with healing and a lot of other comorbidities. So because of that hesitancy to want to do those kind of operations on these sick patients, the uh, uh, endovascular interventions have become very popular. And we have multiple, multiple different techniques we can use for the endovascular treatment of patients who have limb-threatening ischemia. Balloon angioplasty can be a simple balloon, can be a cutting balloon where the calcium is scored to help uh, initiate the cleavage planes, or you can use a drug-coated balloon, which uh, we're going to talk about these. Uh, stenting, uh, we have balloon expandable stents as well as self-expanding stents. We also have stents that elute uh, medications to decrease restenosis. We had covered stents, both the loop balloon expandable and self-expanding, and there's an the option of removing plaque with atherectomy, which can be either cutting or with laser techniques. I'm going to discuss each of these a bit. So the, uh, the workhorse of endovascular treatment for lower extremity arterial disease is balloon angioplasty, which is basically a controlled injury to the plaque in the arterial wall. So what's done is a long skin, uh, guide wire is placed across the occluded or stenotic area. If you can't get a wire across, you can't treat. So that's the first step of any endovascular therapy. And then a long skinny balloon is inflated under high pressure across the narrowing with the concept that you'll actually fracture that plaque, expand the elastic elements in the wall of the artery, and then hopefully the artery will heal with a widened lumen after that intervention. And this is just a, uh, a histology specimen of what it looks like after a balloon angioplasty. This is actually a patient, uh, an artery that had a balloon angioplasty. Obviously, the patient didn't do very well because we had the specimen. But what you basically get with the balloon is you get a series of radial <laughs> fractures in the plaque. And then what you hope is after you fracture the, the, the calcified plaque, you can actually stretch it breaks you break the internal elastic lamina probably and have the external elastic components maintain the integrity of the wall of the artery and then have it remodel. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It shouldn't really work, but it turns out it does. 
And this is a uh, summary slide, a meta-analysis of 30 studies, all in patients with intrapopetial artery disease for a critical limb ischemia, that means rest pain or tissue loss, who had simple balloon angioplasty. Primary patency, meaning not the, how, how long that artery stays open without having to do anything else, not perfect, 50% of three years, but not terrible. But lymph salvage rates of 80% at three years. So this works. It's not perfect, but it does work, and it's much lower morbidity for the patient. So this has been a big question in our field is where to put the endovascular therapies versus the traditional surgical therapies. This is still the best study we have on this question, and it's become a, it's an old study. It was published in 2005, and the, the later results published in 2008 called the BASIL trial. It's a European trial done primarily in the UK. 27 centers of patients with rest pain or tissue loss randomized either to bypass surgery first or angio angioplasty first with an endpoint of amputation-free survival. And this is from the, the follow-up study showing out to seven years that whether patients get balloon angioplasty first or surgical bypass first, their limb salvage rate is basically the same. And survival is basically the same. So it suggests that balloon angioplasty actually is an effective first-line therapy for these patients, at least as effective as surgical bypass. But we know that surgical bypass, I mean, we know that balloon angioplasty doesn't always work, particularly in heavily calcified superficial femoral popteal arteries. So there has been enthusiasm for using stents. So I told you there's a couple of different kinds of stents. The stents that are most commonly used in the infrainguinal arteries are self-expanding stents because they are more flexible, and these arteries are exposed to lots of flexion and torsion. And so this is just an example of a nitinol nickel titanium alloy flexible stent that would be used in a lower extremity artery. And this is an example of an elderly patient with diabetes mellitus who I saw with a uh, ulcers on his toe, had a, totally, a total occlusion of his popteal artery. We were able to get a guide wire across it and then stented that artery and with a very nice angiographic result uh, and a patient then who goes home the next day with a Band-Aid in his groin as opposed to the large incision you saw in that other uh, uh, photograph from a surgical bypass. Data are a little bit fuzzy, so it's been hard to show that stents, at least in the superficial and femoral, superficial femoral artery, are a whole lot better than balloon angioplasty. This is a review of, of several different studies comparing balloon angioplasty, randomized trial of balloon angioplasty versus nitinol stents. And most of them, well, we've got one, this study here, stent was better than angioplasty, no difference, stent better, no difference, stent better. So the, the, the results are kind of all over the place. And it's really not clear that stenting really is better than plain balloon angioplasty, at least in the superficial femoral artery. And this is another uh, uh, summary slide looking at multiple different uh, uh, studies looking at uh, balloon angioplasty versus stenting. And you can see the results, the risk ratio, that stents may be a little bit better, a little lower risk stenosis, but with a p-value that's not significant and the, uh, the confidence interval crosses unity. So really hard to show in studies that stents are really better than balloon angioplasty in the superficial femoral So not quite the holy grail that we thought it was going to be. So the next concept was covered stents. So one of the problems with a stent is a patient will get intimal hyperplasia, will get ingrowth of tissue into those stents. And so if you use a covered stent, it's like putting a bypass inside the artery, thought that that might be a better option. And it's one place that this has been used uh, a fair bit is what we call in-stent stenosis. So a patient who gets a stent, that stent becomes near, now you can put a covered stent and hopefully take away that process. And there's an example of that here. So the blue arrows in the left panel, this patient actually had a nitinol stent inserted right through this section of the superficial femoral artery. You can see a significant instant stenosis here, more stenosis here, as well as additional stenosis in the artery distal to the stent. This patient was treated with a uh, covered stent that extends, the red is the new covered stent, so it overlapped the original stent. And this is the, the final image showing a nice angiographic result. So it turns out not clear that this is a holy grail either. These are a summary of randomized trials and registry studies comparing covered stents to nitinol stents. And the first trial here didn't show any difference between the covered stent and the bare metal stent. This study did suggest some advantage of the covered stent over the bare metal stent. And a little more detail from that study showed that 
the covered stents seem to do better. This is primary patency, this is time, this is the overall study space. It didn't show a whole lot of difference between the covered stent in red and the bare metal stent in blue. But for patients who had lesions that were longer than 20 centimeters, the covered stents seemed to perform better in terms of patency versus the bare metal stents. So maybe some advantage, advantage in patients with really long levels of atherosclerotic involvement. So drug eluding stents have been uh, all the rage in the coronary uh, field. So drug eluding stents are stents that deliver an anti-metabolite drug. So the concern with uh, restenosis in any arterial intervention is intimal hyperplasia. It's a process where smooth muscle cells migrate from the arterial media into the intima, into the inner layer of the artery. Those cells go from being a uh, uh, a uh, contractile morphology to a secretory morphology. They basically become fibroblasts. They start secreting a bunch of protein. They reproduce themselves. They build up this bulky material under the intima, which then goes on to narrow the artery. It's a relatively early phase reaction. tends to happen within the first few months to 12 months after an intervention. And it's the Achilles heel of everything we do to treat uh, blocked arteries. So the thought was, if we can give a drug that stops metabolism, so we can stop these cells from proliferating, stop that process. So the way these stents are designed, they're metal stents, and you can see this is a, a, a cartoon of what it looks like, basically. You have the metal stent, and then you have some sort of chemical that will stick to the stent, and then you have a, the drug sandwiched between what's called the excipient, which helps slowly release the drug, and then there's some other layer on top. And this is just a slide showing uh, the release of the drug. The drug here is in the purple line. And can you see that the drug is released over the course of about 50 days. So it stays on the stent for a while and is quite is, is potentially active at decreasing the risk of cellular ingrow ingrowth, at least for a period of time, as a concept of how these things work. And unfortunately, maybe not also as good as we hoped as well. It depends, it looks like it depends on the drug. So the first uh, anti-metabolite drug used for a peripheral artery stent was serolimus. And the study looking at the serolimus uh, drug eluding stents showed no advantage of balloon uh, versus bare metal stent. And that was a, a huge disappointment to uh, those of us who work in this area. Subsequently, a uh, stent has come out with paclitaxel, a different anti-metabolite drug. And that study compared uh, drug, drug eluding stent to plain balloon angioplasty. It was much better than balloon angioplasty. They did do a post hoc analysis versus bare metal stent, although the study was not designed that way, and it suggested that the drug eluding stents are better than bare metal stents. So there's still not a whole lot of data on drug eluding stents, but maybe better, probably better than plain stents with uh, if you have paclitaxel in the in the stent. The current rage is are drug coded, coded balloons, and this this seems to be uh, maybe the best answer at this moment. The same drug we just talked about, paclitaxel, which seemed to be better for the stents, is what's been used on these balloons. And the same concept uh, with the, the drug with an excipient placed on the surface of the balloon. The concept is you just inflate the balloon for three minutes into the artery, maintain that contact time, the drug gets delivered to their arterial wall. Doesn't necessarily seem like that would make a big difference, but it does seem to work, and it works without leaving that metal behind, which is thought to, to induce a persistent uh, stimulus for the intimal hyperplasia. So that's why stents may not be the best idea. And these are the two-year data from the randomized trial using one of these drug-coated balloons. So in red is a primary patency for the drug-coated balloon. In blue is a primary patency for plain, uh, a plain balloon out to two years. Primary patency of 80% versus 50% showing a significant advantage. And most recently, I couldn't find a slide, but the three-year uh, data have been presented. I'm not sure it's been published yet. And still shows that three years a significant advantage in primary patency of the drug-coated balloons versus the plain balloons. And similar down here, this is just how often the patients need to get re-intervened on that same segment. Also showed the drug-coated balloon performed better than the plain balloon out to two years. And uh, a similar force plot, plot looking at uh, drug-coated balloons versus uncoated balloons, looking at three different randomized trials. All those trials showed that the drug-coated balloon, the paclitaxel-coated balloons, did better than an uncoated balloon. And this was highly statistically significant when looking at all three trials. They all lined up almost exactly none of the confidence bars cross unity. So suggesting that this actually probably is a better mousetrap. 
and just another slide basically showing the same thing. We do see uh, crossing unity here on the, the drug coated balloons versus the, the plain balloons, but probably, actually this is, I'm sorry, this is a balloon versus a stent. I'm sorry, this is a drug coated balloon versus stents, suggesting that the blood, the drug coated balloons may have an advantage over stenting, and this is where the bias seems to have been sh uh, shifted currently. This is a summary looking at, I just thought this was kind of a cool slide, looking at all the various technologies with the closer to the top being better. So the best technology seems to be a paclitaxel coated balloon in terms of patency, then a paclitaxel stent next, a covered stent after that, and then after that, the uh, uh, just a plain metal stent, the serolimus stent, and plain balloon angioplasty. So it seems like the paclitaxel delivery systems may actually be the... Uh, the current technology with the best outcome for our patients. And then the last technique that can be used is atherectomy. This can be mechanical. There's uh, burrs that you can basically just burr your way through the plaque. There are tangential cutting plaques where you can basically shave plaque off the wall of the artery. Uh, there are orbital catheters that rotate around and make a bigger lumen that you just get with a burr. And there are lasers that can vaporize the plaque. I'm not going to say much about these because this is a technology I don't think really has a whole lot to offer. This is a forest plot looking at atherectomy showing versus plain balloon angioplasty and it really doesn't show any advantage of atherectomy and probably the disadvantage of atherectomy and that's been my impression. So I'm personally not a big fan of atherectomy. It leads to a lot of embolization. I don't think a lot of advantage. Whew, that's a lot of stuff. So let's, uh, let's go to a definition pathological. Reasonable way to go. <laughs> All right. So we talked, uh, just going to kind of sum things up here a little bit, we talked about the basal trial earlier. Uh, that's a, really the only good data we have on endovascular versus surgical uh, treatment. That's an out-of-date trial because it allowed only plain balloon angioplasty. And as you just heard, we have lots of tools better than, that are different, at least, than plain balloon angioplasty, potentially better. So that study's gotten somewhat out of date. So right now there is a trial going on uh, primarily in uh, the United States, but it's recently been expanded to centers outside the United States called the BEST CLI trial. We are participating in this trial here at UC Davis. It's taking patients with either rest pain or tissue loss, and it's stratifying those into two different groups because it turns out the outcomes are quite different for those two different presentations. And it's basically looking for patients who have atherosclerosis from the groins down. So the patients have to have or be given adequate aortic, aortoiliac inflow, has to be an adequate target for revascularization, and then they're randomized either to any endovascular therapy or to surgical bypass. So a very pragmatic trial. Pretty much anything that we can currently do, the patients are just randomized to the, the concept of surgical bypass versus the concept of endovascular therapy. They're going also looking at two different cohorts. The patients who have good grade saphenous vein and patients who don't have good grade saphenous vein, which is a big question. Uh, what to do with patients without vein? Should we do all this endo or should we try to bypass them? And then the primary endpoint's a little bit complicated, but it's major adverse limb event free survival, which means avoidance of a major amputation or avoidance of a major reintervention, a new bypass, a sequential bypass, or a thrombectomy or thrombolysis for an occluded reconstruction. And similarly, at the same time, this trial is going on in the United States, the BASO coordinators in the UK have also uh, are running a parallel trial, very similar, some slight differences in design. It's a randomized multicenter trial, vein bypass versus best endovascular therapy for CLI, confined in this study to just infrapopteal disease, although they can also have thermopopteal disease. They can have breast pain uh, and or tissue loss, so they're not being stratified, which I think is a, uh, a deficit of this trial. And the primary endpoint also is, a, is, is more uh, uh, objective. It's amputation-free survival, but may miss some of the other important endpoints. One thing that Basel II has over the best CLI trial, they're also looking at cost. So you can do a cost analysis of which uh, treatments are uh, uh, more cost-effective. So in summary, patients with diabetes are at risk for limb loss due to foot ulcers. Foot ulcers happen from mechanical abnormalities, sensory abnormalities, arterial insufficiency, any one of those or any combination of those, and it's entirely central that you need to diagnose and treat the underlying cause if you want to be successful with, for the patient. Patients with diabetes do get atherosclerosis, virtually always just to the groin, and particularly involving their arteries below the knee. 
Arterial disease can be treated with either surgical techniques or with endovascular therapy. And we currently have two large uh, multi-center trials going on on two continents to help define what are the best indications for management of these patients. And it looks like drug delivery with devices is improving these results. And currently the drug uh, coated balloons really seem to be the, uh, uh, a, a, a great adjunct for us now. In the United States, we only have balloons available to treat the femoral popliteal segments. We do not yet have balloons available to treat the infrapopliteal arteries, which is a big problem. Those balloons are available in Europe and have shown a promise in the infrapopliteal arteries as well. So that's all I have. Thank you. Have any questions? Dr. Farmer. I, I am personally very pessimistic about our ability to pharmacologically make plaque go away. I am more optimistic our ability to prevent plaque. So there have been a host of, study, a host of studies over the last few decades trying to show plaque reversal. A couple have shown some mild results. The trouble is it's very hard to, to measure plaque in vivo because early stages of atherosclerosis, the artery wall, the adventitia actually expands. So you maintain the lumen, basically have a significant plaque burden and still have a lumen that looks normal and any technique that looks at the lumen. So typical arteriogram, CT scan is not gonna show it. A duplex ultrasound is not gonna show it. Intervascular ultrasound will show it, but that's invasive. So it's hard to non-invasively measure plaque. And that's been, I think, one of the big problems with the studies trying to show plaque regression. The endpoints are all kind of fuzzy. Yes, yeah, so you can, you can do it with CT, which also involves contrast, though, and a lot of radiation. But still, it's been, the, my reading literature on plaque reversal has been completely disappointing. And the reason I'm pessimistic is much of the mature plaque is basically non, um, what's the word, like not viable, non-physiologically, uh, non-metabolic. So it's cholesterol, it's calcium, it's basically dead cells. It's a bunch of stuff that's not metabolically active. So I have a hard time imagining that a pharmacologic technique is going to reverse that. Uh, I think the, the gains are gonna be made in limiting the development of plaque. We haven't made a whole lot of progress on that. The biggest medical advance in the management of atherosclerotic pathology has been the statins. And that's because the statins have the pleiotropic effect of decreasing the oxidative state of the plaque, makes plaques more stable. So acute atherosclerotic events, strokes, heart attacks, sudden limb ischemia, are due to plaque rupture. And statins rapidly decrease the risk of plaque rupture. The incidence of myocardial infarction and stroke in the last few decades in the United States has plummeted dramatically as the use of statins has increased. Correlation does not imply causation, but it's probably the reason. So I th we're getting better at stabilizing plaques. But I'm not sure that there's been a whole lot of data or uh, progress in figuring out how to prevent the formation of plaques either. We still don't really understand how what causes atherosclerosis. There are three different. There have been three different theories of atherogenesis in my career, and I believe the current one's probably fake news also. So I, you know, I don't think we understand the disease well enough yet to find that holy grail of how to prevent it. So. Sounds like an area right for basic science. You right? bet. You bet. Mike? Hey, Dr. Pepevic, and just thinking back as I was listening to your talk to what I learned in vascular surgery as a resident and how that really doesn't apply anymore. And so I kind of more abstract. Same like what I learned about endocrinology, so don't hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> At least I don't remember it, so yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So these residents of ours are going to be looking at jobs and snoring. 
Cla yeah, cl classic question, important question. So it's it, the the bigger concern for the vascular surgery education community has been the open aortic stuff, because open aortic surgery is going away for a large part. Unfortunately, there's, there's still a, a, a subgroup of patients that that's their only option. But as a consequence, we do 80% of the aortic work intervascularly. So our trainees see 80% intervascular. No one's getting the open exposure. A little difference for the, you're asking a different question than more for the distal stuff. So it turns out vein bypasses are still a good option. They may be the better option. And we're, I think we're all waiting with a lot of curiosity to see how the best CLI and the Basel II trials pan out. The Basel trials did suggested that bypass should not go away. It's my theory that we get better volume flow with a bypass than we do with endovascular intervention for patients that have multi-level disease, which is a typical situation with uh, ischemia. In fact, we're working with a medical student right now to try to see if we can get some data to support that bias, because I don't know if it's true. Uh, so I think it may well be that that vein bypass is still a skill that uh, our trainees need. Our trainees here certainly get a lot of experience in the vascular, but still fair experience in the open lower extremity arterial reconstruction. So I think the vascular surgeon of the early 21st century still can do both, and I think they'll be okay with that. That being said, you're kind of another nuance to your question of what about practicing vascular surgery in the hinder lens? I think it's getting harder and harder to do, to do good vascular surgery, because I don't think good vascular surgery is just surgical bypass. I think you need to, to really be a good vascular surgeon and give your patient their best options you need to have all of these tools. Why I really see the endovascular techniques making their biggest impact are the 80-year-olds with critical limb ischemia. Patients with multiple comorbidities who aren't gonna tolerate a big operation don't need five or 10-year patency. They need a couple years to keep their leg on to keep them out of the nursing home. The endovascular skills that really help, endovascular techniques really help those patients. And so I think you're a vascular surgeon, you have to be able to do both, which means you have to be in a place that's got the imaging capabilities and even more importantly, expensive inventory to be able to provide these interventions. So I think the old days of general surgeons doing vascular surgery, general, vascular surgeons trying to do these in resource limited environments is, is somewhat limited. So I think it needs to be regionalized. Dr. Humphreys? It's a good point that you also bring up. It's one of the reasons why um, we've tried to start expanding into the hinder lens some elements because we need patients further away because it is hard for them. For a small hospital, for Victor? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I didn't, I didn't bring that up because the data are all over the place. And some of the data I've seen on uh, absorbable stents, at least some histological data, show a pretty significant inflammatory reaction in the artery with increased into microplasia. And we just don't have much good data yet. So I actually think we're probably going to be better off with a technology that doesn't leave anything, including the bioresorbable stent, in. Um, I, think if you, I think I like the concept of delivering the drug where you need to get the drug on the balloon. So I think some mechanical, as I talked about, this plaque is a mechanical problem. So I think a mechanical treatment is going to be necessary, but whether it's going to be better to not leave something that else that needs to be absorbed other than what you're trying to put there behind is a good idea. I'm still somewhat skeptical, but, but we'll see. A good question. Dr. Cook? Yeah, uh, Dr. Campbell sort of released the floodgates on the 10,000 
put to you questions. Um, I've always sort of admired vascular surgeons and their ability to uh, uh, maintain to first be leaders in those wire wire in the vascular skill and then taking it to another level. Um, especially now that other um, uh, specialties such as cardiology um, and in the early days interventional radiology were involved with this. It, it seems from my perspective that vascular surgery has a, a, a good relationship with primary care and receives direct referrals with primary care. Uh, can, can you comment on sort of uh, your relationship with primary care uh, and how you feel that should be cultivated and, and continued in your, in, your, in your strategies for doing that? That's a really good question. I think one of the reasons that vascular surgery has adapted well and positioned itself well, positioned itself well in a changing environment is we've always been disease focused and we've always been fully managing our patients. So from the, in, the inception of the specialty, we have been the experts on taking care of patients with blood vessel disease. We do a lot of medical management. It's, it's a double-edged sword. So if you look at our clinics, if you look at the new referrals to our patient, uh, new referrals to our clinics, we probably end up doing a procedure on 10%, maybe? 9% we're manage, managing medically. And we get sent lots of questions and referrals about the medical management of patients with blood vessel disease, arterial and venous disease, and lymphatic disease, and with wounds. And so we've embraced all those things. So as a consequence, the primary care doctors know when they've got a patient with blood vessel disease, we're the ones to call. And I think that's helped us to be able to help protect our turf, if you will, because we have always been the experts on the total management of our patients. And I think that's gonna be very important for us to maintain that if we're gonna maintain the viability of our, of our uh, specialty. So I think that lends itself to a good relationship with the primary care doctors. We're not really tertiary referral at all, or more secondary referral. We get tertiary and quaternary referrals as well from other surgeons and vascular surgeons but we get the primary referrals from the primary care doctors also, and I think that that has helped us quite a bit. Dr. Farmer? So sort of a corollary to that. I remember the article in, I think, the lay press, and maybe even the New England Journal that talked about you know, some, I think it was a cardiologist in Texas who was putting way more stents in anybody that was sort of humanly possible, and a lot of just distal <coughs> Stent placement, probably based on angiographic findings, not real symptoms. Ocular stenotic reflux, we call that, yes. Yeah. You see it, you stent it, yeah. I, I love your definition. So, um, you know, how do you stem the tide? How, how do you approach that? Is the field thinking about that? Well, that's, that's one of the concerns that vascular surgeons have had about other specialists working in this field. And some of it may be valid. Some of it may, may not be valid. It's brought to the forefront by examples like you just uh, described. But we fear, we, because we feel that we manage the whole patient and we understand the natural history disease process and understand that every lesion doesn't need to be treated, and we have all the tools to treat patients. I couldn't be struck on the patient we talked about today with the bleeding from the stomach, having to wait for somebody else to scope that patient. That's one thing that a lot of things I don't like about being a vascular surgeon. That's one thing I really like about being a vascular surgeon. There's very little trouble that our patients get into that we can't take care of because we manage, we can, we can take we, all the tools that are needed to treat the problems our patients have, we have. And it was, much, it was frustrating in the days we had to call an interventional radiologist to do an arteriogram or to do an angioplasty. That was, didn't realize this much at the time, that was an awkward and un uncomfortable place to be. We don't have that predicament now. Uh, but I think we understand the patient's diseases better, and if you ask me, obviously I'm biased, cardiologists, interventional radiologists should not be treating vascular disease. It should be someone who dedicates their entire career, academic, clinical interest in these disease processes. And I think the patients are less likely to get inappropriate treatment from a vascular surgeon than they are from another specialist. It doesn't mean that there aren't vascular surgeons out there doing all sorts of bad stuff. There are, and there are a lot of poorly trained vascular surgeons out there, and there's some really outstanding cardiologists, really outstanding interventional radiologists working in this and who have provided a huge amount of uh, research that's helped us. John Laird, an example, is a cardiologist who worked here who, who really was doing this, I think, right. So you have to be a little careful about throwing stones, but by the same token, uh, it's, you gotta understand the diseases to treat the diseases, so. 
Sure. Bill, first of all, that that was a great talk and not not uh, not too minimalistic. I mean, I think it uh, hit all the great points. It was very educational. It covered all the ground. I, I think that was outstanding. So well, thank you. That. Yeah. Secondly, if people were talking about this sort of big picture, with, with, with all this advances in techniques of dealing with arteries, what's been the global effect on patients? Has, has amputation rates been less? Is survival longer? I mean, what, what's been the overall outcome of all of this yeah. money and expense and trials? Yeah, the last, uh, I just was looking, I'm giving a talk on Thursday of the primary care doctors, and for, the, for that talk, I just recently looked up, the, the most recent thing I could see, I was, I was surprised I couldn't find anything more current was a uh, 2009 article by Phil Goodney, and he looked at national trends for lower extremity arterial disease. And what the slide shows is that lower extremity bypass has dropped by about 50%. Endovascular therapy has increased threefold, and amputations have dropped by about a third. Uh, and there are other data that suggest the same thing. So it's our impression we actually have decreased the number of uh, amputations by I, I think it's really happening. I don't think that the in the vascular therapies are necessarily better, but they can be applied to a larger population of patients. So I can tell you my own practice. I've been here for 25 years. 25 years ago, an 89-year-old woman who could barely get out of her wheelchair and hobble to the commode and back into her bed by herself, but was living in her own house, who came in with five ulcerating toes, we'd say, we're going to paint that with some betadine, do the best we can, and in a month, when we have to cut your leg, she come back in a month to cut her leg off. She go to nursing home, get bed sores and pneumonia, and die. That patient now we can take, we can potentially do endovascular therapy, get her toes to heal. She may still die in a year or two. She probably will die in a year or two, but she's potentially going to die at home, hobbling from a wheelchair to the commode, not have to go to the nursing home. So those, I think, that's where we we've, we've decreased the amputations is by treating patients who before we said, you don't have the horsepower to undergo a bypass. That's all you're going to get. I don't think that we make things, I think we don't necessarily make things better with bypass, just treating more patients. That's why the number has gone up so much. We're treating patients who otherwise would have no reasonable option. So, Dr. Press. I Yeah. Excellent question. The renal failure patients with, uh, with uh, lower extreme arterial occlusive disease. So the renal failure patients are the most difficult subgroup of patients that we treat. Uh, it's the only group. So if you look at any study over the years looking at patency of a reconstruction versus limb salvage, and I showed a couple of those uh, uh, slides for this talk, if the reconstruction has a 70% patency or whatever time interval, the limb salvage at time interval will be 80 or 90 percent. So most everybody, even if, you're, if reconstruction lasts for a while, they heal their wound, their limb lasts a while beyond their reconstruction. The converse of that is a patient with end-stage renal disease. Virtually every study that looks at that, their, their graft patency will be 70 percent, limb salvage 50 percent. They lose their limbs with patent reconstructions. So they don't heal well. They have lots of in-vessel disease that we cannot treat. They just don't do as well. Uh, virtually every study that looks at mortality shows that renal failure falls out as a predictor mortality. I think that's not just in vascular, I think that's across the board. That is a almost universal predictor of poor survival for no matter what you're looking at. Uh, and for as far though as patency reconstructions, it does not always fall out as an in, in, uh, independent risk factor. So they don't live as long, they frequently lose their limbs anyway, but as far as which intervention is better, I don't think there's a clear answer. They're harder, the patients with end-stage renal disease are harder to do endovascular therapies on because their arteries are so calcified, so they frequently don't respond to anything we do to try to push their plaque around, but by the same token, they're very difficult to operate on also because, as you know, those arteries are not easy to sew to, frequently crumble, and, and don't work so well. So uh, I don't know if I can answer a uh, question specifically, except to say that they're a very challenging population. Maybe Dr. Jan's got some insight. Uh, no, that's an excellent talk, Bill. Um, part of the reason may be that uh, if we accept that 
greatest portion of uh, end-stage renal disease patients are diabetics. So that, that brings us back to the very topic of today's uh, discussion, is the role of diabetes. And all of these different modalities are good, but the diabetic patient may respond quite differently because of that renal calcinosis, because they are more advanced, because these acids are plaques, just different to deal with. So on that score, do you have any data with respect to all the different modalities that you've nicely shown uh, how they respond to diabetes? Uh, that's an excellent question also. So the diabetes also in this literature sometimes falls out as a predictor of worse outcome and sometimes doesn't. So it's, it's a little, it's not always a uh, predictor of worse outcome if you, when you, if you, uh, if you match the cohorts for, you know, for the disease, uh, for the other comorbidities and the, uh, the anatomy of their disease, their, uh, their extent of the disease doesn't always fall out as an independent risk factor. So that's a little harder to answer also. So diabetes, sometimes patients do worse, sometimes they don't do worse. Uh, and I, other than that, I'm not sure I can give you a real specific answer. Bill, thank you very much. Sorry I have to cut off this great conversation. Thanks, Thanks for the question.